Uh, my name is Kerry Brand. Uh, I uh, work at Plantronics. I am the uh, VP of Innovation there. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce, uh, uh, you know, a friend and a mentor, uh, Joe Burton. So Joe is a uh, our CTO and Executive Vice President. He is a passionate technologist, futurist, and quite a visionary. So I'm I'm very uh, excited that he's here today to actually share some insights with you around the Internet of Things topic that's very passionate, I think, to all of us. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Burton. Joe? Oh. 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 Well, thanks, Carrie. And I, I guess the first thing that you all just heard is uh, Carrie desperately needs an upgrade on the mentor side. So if anybody out here is willing to serve as a mentor, I'll hook you guys up when we're done. Because uh, you know he could stand some help, apparently. Well, thank you all so much for, uh, for coming to listen to what we have to say for a little bit. You know, as we get started talking about IoT, the first thing I want to do is actually make a correction as I see it. I'm actually going to ditch the uh, IoT because, frankly, um, I don't completely buy it. For me, I don't think of it as the Internet of Things. I think about it as the Internet. And I want to talk about some of the changes that are coming in the Internet. As we started the internet uh, quite a few years ago, and sadly I'm old enough to remember, um, I really didn't think about the first internet as the internet of computers. And I don't think about the current internet as the internet of smartphones and servers and location services. I think about it as the internet, and when I think, I realize that I'm actually not thinking about the internet at all. I mean, I'm a networking guy uh, originally and then became a communications uh, person. And more recently, I'm kind of into wearables and whatnot. But frankly, it's not the internet of computers. It's not the internet of mobile devices. It's not the internet of things. What we think about are the services that are built on top of it. And frankly, I find IoT too limiting. So. You know, the problem is when I think of Internet of Things, it takes me back to my networking days. It takes me back to, to thinking very narrowly about how in the heck are we going to connect all these pieces together? What are the protocols? What are the trade-offs between battery life and, uh, and bandwidth and latency and richness of data, et cetera, et cetera? And while all those are super important and we're going to talk about those too, it's too narrow. It pulls my point of view someplace that I really don't want to be. Instead, I tend to think of technology, I tend to think of innovation, uh, true innovation, if you will, come on, baby, as something that actually removes barriers. I think of true innovation as things that fundamentally tear down walls, removes friction, and enables entirely new services that simply weren't possible before, or at least it fundamentally changes the economics around it. So that's what the internet does. What the internet does, and we'll talk about the implications as we connect the next couple of orders of magnitudes of devices to it, what the internet does is removes barriers, reduces friction, creates and destroys economies of all kinds, and reshapes them in some really, really interesting ways. So interesting part of that is that, frankly, technology also is amoral. And I didn't say immoral. It's not bad. Technology is amoral. Technology is neither good nor bad. It just is. So as we invent all these fabulous new technologies, they can be used in many, many, many ways. So the same technologies that I've been involved in over the last 20 years that have brought on putting information at our fingertips, have brought on remote uh, telemedicine, that have brought on distance education and done all these fabulous things that have flattened the world through communications prices dropping so far, really where a lot of my uh, time has been spent, you know, they've also enabled cybercrime. They've enabled stalking. They've helped terrorists. Okay, technology is amoral. It's what you do with it that makes sense.
or that, that actually is really interesting. So as we bring the next couple of orders of magnitude of devices onto the internet, what we call the internet of things, it's very interesting to think about not only connecting the stuff, but what do we enable? What are the social changes that brings? What are the new economics that that brings? So when we talk about this innovation, it's great. I tried to find an old, old, old example of true innovation and the things that it changes. And I decided to start in my hometown. So I actually grew up in uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, which is really, uh, re hey, you've heard of Dayton, Ohio. Is that right? Can you find it on a map? Fan Oh, OK. So yes, people in Columbus know Dayton, Ohio. It's the place that they laugh at. That's right. OK, so I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. I'm in S Santa Cruz these days by way of Seattle. That's where I met Carrie. But you know, Dayton, Ohio, it turned out, was almost the Silicon Valley of the industrial age. Lots of things were invented there. So one of the things that was invented was the thing that enabled the jump from the middle of the, or from the, the car crank to the middle. What was invented during that technology transition? Anybody know what the core, anybody know what the core was that helped us go from there to the middle? Guesses? Yeah, somebody said it. The starter motor. Okay. A gentleman by the name of Charles Kettering from my hometown invented the starter motor. And what was the initial economic value of the starter motor? Well, that's pretty obvious. Charles Kettering made a bunch of money. And the first mover advantage, the car company that put the starter motor in first, had about a three-year runway of competitive advantage. And that was pretty cool. Just as a trivia, who, who put that starter motor in? The car company's still around now. Anybody know? Fascinatingly enough, the early adopter was Cadillac. So uh, when you talk about things changing, Cadillac sales skyrocketed. But you know, Charles made money, Cadillac made money, but what really happened? What got enabled with the starter motor? Well, the secondary effect was women started driving in significant numbers because of the starter motor. Okay. So women start driving in significant numbers. And what's the tertiary effect, the other downstream effects? Well, those should be somewhat obvious now that you're in the movie. Women start driving in meaningful numbers. How we shop changes. We don't shop once a week when, some, when, when somebody can drive them to the store. They shop anytime they want. They enter the workforce. They want their say. The whole economics and social fabric of the country actually shifts for 20 or 30 years with downstream effects, at least partially, from the starter motor. Okay? So this is kind of a little bit of what we're going to be on as we talk about uh, the next generation of the internet over the next few minutes. Primary effects are great, but what are the new economics? What are the new social changes that come along and the potential downsides as that occurs? Now, the third transition going across, a little less, uh, little less um, uh, profound, but certainly as we went from the key to the key fob, if you will, the initial idea of that was convenience. I can leave my key fob in my pocket when I walk up to my car and I just open the door and in I go and, off, and, and, in I go and off I drive and I don't have to pull it out. I can have things in both of my hands. But even there, little economic disruptions. First of all, the people that used to make extra keys for cars, the local hardware store, the Walmart, the wherever, turns out that actually was a substantial revenue, revenue stream for them, and it's gone. Okay, That feels like a negative. On the other hand, cars that have truly smart key fobs, you get lower insurance rates. Why? Because it's effectively impossible to hotwire a car that has that. The economics change around insurance. The economics change around stealing cars. Ironically, the whole secondary parts market around don't ask where they came from takes a big hit with this.
So a whole lot of social dynamics change with these innovations. So let's talk about kind of the newer version of this that's hitting us all right now. So this is the latest one. The idea of physical keys to buildings, or in this case to a residence, going to a uh, internet connected or a home automation uh, entry system. Once again, kind of fascinating. I've done this to both my primary residence and my little cabin up by Lake Tahoe for a couple of reasons. And my mom came and visited about a year ago. And she had something fascinating to say about this when I whipped out my iPhone to, uh, to, to open the door. And what she had to say was pretty much what my mom always says. Joey, I think you're an idiot. <laughs> Why would you do this? What's the point? I mean, for goodness sakes, in the time it took you to do that, you could have actually gotten out the key, you could open the door, and we could have already been in the house. And I said, well, Mom, wait a minute. You're right, but think about my life for a minute. And let me explain. So my wife and I, uh, my wife and I each have children from a previous marriage. We got seven kids that are, uh, yeah, a few of you are looking in uh, dismay. Yeah, we got seven kids that are uh, all young adults. So we effectively run, uh, uh, run Burton B&B &B at all times, right? And let me, uh, l let me be clear, this is a not-for-profit organization. There is, a, there is no question, all right? So as we run Burton B&B, &B, interesting things happen. We've got seven kids. Seven kids uh, at any given time uh, probably have at least four significant others in tow. And as you know, significant others come and go on a uh, somewhat regular but unplanned basis. Um, the uh, kids bring friends with them when they come home. We have a large, uh, we're blessed with a large international bunch of friends. We have people from the Netherlands that like to come to our house and our cabin. Carrie comes down from Seattle uh, when he wants to dry out. Uh, we got all kinds of people from how, all over the place. And how does this shift things? Well, it's cool. Although, as my mom uh, says, it takes a little bit more time. But here's how it's shifted our behaviors. It's shifted them in a couple of ways. OK, first of all, we've lowered a barrier to lending our house to somebody because we've removed all physical friction. Nobody has to meet somewhere and get a key. We don't have to tell them what rocket's under uh, by the front door. We don't have to leave it with the neighbor, blah, blah, blah. And it's also actually expanded the number of people we will trust to loan our property to. Why? Because we're not worried about somebody keeping a key, copying a key, swearing it wasn't them that's in the house. Because let me tell you, with a bunch of kids, and they don't mean to be liars, but they are, with a bunch of kids, all right, if there's seven, it's fabulous. There's some alchemy here somewhere. If there's 10 keys to the house and several people have been there, no matter what gets broken or turns up missing, nobody did it because there's this going on, right? So the beauty with this is, hey, if anybody at all given at all times, we surf into the net, we put in expirable codes, we text them to the kids, we text them to the friends, and they can be in the house. They have a code that lasts for a week. At the end of the week, the code expires. If somebody leaves early, we turn it off, we roll the codes, life's good. We get a log of who opened the door, who closed the door, what's going on. It's dramatically changed what we can actually do, who we'll loan the house to, how we loan the house. The interactions are fundamentally different. So the innovation might have been hooking a doorknob up to the internet. And in some respects, that feels kind of dorky. But the service actually allowed us to go through some pretty fundamental behavior changes that are great. So this is what there's going to be a lot more of. As we look at the internet, as we look at the growth that we've already been through and the growth that's in front of us, it looks a lot like this. And here's what excites me so much.
we're still in the inner rings of this guy. You know, right now we're still at the sapling stage. We've had two or three major waves of growth as we connected the internet of computers, and then we built the web on top of it, and then we created the internet of mobile devices, and then we created location-based web services on top of that. But as we connect many, many, many more devices, as we go from a few billion today to definitely a few hundred billion over the next five to 10 years, um, the services need to grow with it. The interconnections need to grow. And it's very interesting not to think about the internet of things and sorting out protocols, which we'll talk about a little. I was a protocol guy way back when. Uh, I still think they're exciting. But the interesting part is to think about the changes, the new economies that get enabled, the new behaviors that get enabled that are as profound as the starter motor and far beyond the internet connected doorknob at, uh, at Burton b and a nonprofit organization. So what are the behaviors that, get, that, that, uh, that have to change? Well, today, services actually can be lashed together in a fairly, uh, in a fairly uh, primitive but effective way. You know, one of, the, one of the gentlemen that came with me from Plantronics was actually mentioning uh, this morning uh, that uh, he notices my Strava runs on Facebook. And absolutely, I mean, I have figured out how to use OAuth to uh, grant Strava access to post on my behalf on Facebook, and it can do this, but it can't do that. And now, you know, I run, and my friends can laugh at me for, uh, you, know, you know, for how slow I run. Um, that's service integration in the current world. But as we go forward, as we get to a few hundred billion devices that are connected up, and yeah, there's a bunch of networking things I think about all the time around little devices and power and uh, power and security and on and on. There's some interesting pieces to this. How many devices, um, how many devices are going to be connected in your home in a few years? Thoughts? I heard 20, I heard 1,000, some uh, hundreds probably. For whatever it's worth, I was in the hundreds category. I was in the middle on this. You know, I can really do the math of looking around my house at the number of windows, the number of light switches, the number of like this, that, and the other, da, da, da. I get to 200 pretty comfortably. There's no question it might be 1,000, but it's certainly 200. So. It's interesting to think about networking all those things and, you know, do we do IP addresses to every, th every single device or do we do Zigbee and Mesh or is it Z-Wave and are there, uh, are there repeaters and blah, blah, blah. All those things need to be worked out, no question. But the services layer is so much more interesting. The services layer that says, all right, I got two or three hundred things in my house and now when my friend Philip comes over to, uh, to stay with me for the weekend, how do, I, how do I grant him guest access to the 200 things? Limited guest access. You know, how do I say he's allowed to turn the lights on and off and he's allowed to open the doorknobs and he's allowed to open the windows and blah, 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 but he's not allowed to change the rules. And at the end of the weekend, how do I quickly revoke all of that? And take it a step farther. At our little cabin up in, uh, up in Tahoe, we keep an old pickup truck there too. So people actually fly in and they drive our car. Well, in the not too distant future, when we replace that pickup truck with one that's uh, a little nicer and, and, and it winds up getting connected as well, Probably I want to I want to give them grant, uh, uh, guest access to the car as well, so you can have the house, you can get in, you can open the windows, you can turn the, the the temperature up and down, you can start the car, you can drive the car, but I want the car geofenced. Philip, you can drive my car, but I've seen you drive. Um, we're capping it at 80, and you got to stay within 50 miles of the house. Okay. And if you go outside of that, maybe it doesn't work, or maybe I just get a text message. I'm not sure. Okay, But how do I grant all this, and then how do I revoke it? Okay, interesting services layer. 
And what's more, at some point in the future, I'll sell this cabin to somebody else, at which point I want to transfer ownership of 200 things and all of the security models that are, that are around it to a new individual. I want to transfer it over here and you own it now. And after you accept, I no longer have access unless you give me guest access. Okay, so connecting all the devices is hard. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But this is harder. You know, a long time back, I was, um, I was involved in uh, some early web services work. And we spent a lot of time talking about um, advertising services and advertising service preference. So if you've ever been involved in any, uh, in any discovery protocol work where one person kind of says, here's what I want to do, and somebody else says, well, I can't do that, but I can do this instead, and you kind of you know, you zero in on the, uh, the version of, uh, of the protocol you want to use through a capabilities exchange. Well, you know, in this future, future world, not only do we have services that need to advertise, I want to advertise at least my preferences to the world around me. So to start very simply, today um, I can advertise, I'd like to send an email. And there are a bunch of servers come online and say, I know how to accept an email and transfer it someplace else. But what I want to do now, I wanted to do it last night at 2 in the morning, was I want to advertise to the world around me that when it's up to me, I want the room to be 69 degrees Fahrenheit and low humidity. I want to advertise that along with many, many, many other things. And you know, I've lashed that together at my home right now through the wonders of a bunch of internet automation and IFTTT. I mean, I spend a lot of time in there writing rules, and as I get near my house, it cools it to the right temperature, and when I leave, it lets it float back to where it should. But I want to advertise it to the world. When I get to my house, I want that to be the case. If I go into a private office or a private conference room, when I book it and it knows I'm getting close, I want it to affect things to that temperature. Boy, when I got to my hotel room yesterday, I wanted it to know that and uh, I wanted it to already know that and do the right stuff. The, um, when, it, when I go into a conference room with three or four other people, or a large room like this, there needs to be some bizarre election mechanism that goes on to understand the correct compromise of the conditions for all of us working together. So as we work through the service discovery around all of those things, it's tremendously more important. But, you know, sadly, right now we're down here. Right now we're down here, and by the way, we're cobbling together a bunch of stuff, and it's all good stuff. These are all of the different protocols. By the way, it's a tenth of them. These are a lot of the big ones. These are the protocols for sort of kind of getting interoperability between various things, industry-specific ones you know, for uh, uh, doing home automation, machine-to-machine -machine things for automating a factory, on and on and on. But I would submit, as I've been involved with quite a few of these, that in many respects they're getting it all wrong. They're thinking about how do we connect things and how do we solve the primary economic case that they can think of. How do I connect five things in a house in order to make a little bit of money because my home is automated? How do I connect these five things in a manufacturing uh, facility in order to make a production line run slightly more efficiently? What makes the internet so amazing, what has created so much economic growth, is the unintended secondary and tertiary consequences of connecting things. The key is to actually think about, to, to think about the right open systems that can actually enable things that we didn't expect. When somebody calls and says they're using your stuff for something you've never intended, is your first reaction, wow, 
or is your first reaction, oh shit? Okay? And if your first reaction is, oh shit, that, uh, oh shit, and by the way, sir, you have violated your uh, terms of service, click, um, prepare to be disrupted. Okay? Your first reaction has to be, wow, that's cool. Tell me more. I'm here to help. Okay? It has to be. Anybody on here that's thinking closed systems are thinking about it wrong. What we need to be thinking about very, very much is we need to start at the end and work backwards. What's your dream for what you'd like to enable on top of all this technology? And then bring three people in from entirely different backgrounds and ask them what they would like to enable on top of it. And then work backwards to the services and the protocols that can help invent that future that can help invent that future that you, were, uh, that you were thinking of. So what are the structures that help orchestrate all this stuff? Well, you know, it's interesting. There's a few contenders. I'm going to go from protocols to behavior. But I'm going to jump back to my house to do it for a couple of minutes. You know, what you see here, and, uh, you know, Carrie helped me out. What you see here is smoke, OK? So I think we would all agree that when smoke is in our house, we'd like to know, OK? So to do that in your house today, 15 years ago, let's go back in time. Everybody here lives in the future. 15 years ago, you had two alarms in your house. You had a smoke alarm that dealt with visible smoke, and you had a carbon monoxide detector that dealt with invisible smoke or carbon monoxide uh, vapor. And when smoke was detected, that solid state system that wasn't connected would, would emit a buzzing sound, and you hoped somebody was there to hear it. And maybe if you were very rich or very paranoid, then you were hooked up to a home alarm a company that would receive that over a POTS telephone line and would then call the fire department, right? OK, so you know, how do we want it to work today? Well, I'll tell you how I'd like it to work. So how I would like it to work today is when these detectors in my house um, detect smoke, what I'd actually like them to do is raise an alarm, know where it is in the house, because I'm a big nerd and I got stuff all over the place. I'd like it to turn on the right security camera for that part of the house, capture about 10 seconds of video, text me a link to it to my phone, and then if I don't look at the video and respond with disregard within a couple of minutes, then I want it to try to call my neighbor, and if my neighbor doesn't answer, then I want it to call the fire department. Okay? I mean, that's kind of approximately how I want it to work. You might want it to work a little differently, but close enough. So, in my house, I have that sort of kind of maybe cobbled together. And there are various vendors that are very proudly explaining that as long as you buy everything from them, they can make that work sort of kind of maybe. But we don't want to buy everything from them. We all want best to breed. We want to follow fashion. We want to follow trends. You know, I want to buy a Nest now, and I want to buy an Apple HomeKit thing later, and God knows what else uh, from somebody else uh, past that. And we'll, we want it all to work. So what are the different possible mechanisms for making all this work together? You know, so the first one that I hear a lot about is the super remote control, right? So there's a variety of people out there that are talking, no, no, no. So I have an app for your smartphone, and it's really cool, and it has a rules engine in it, and I've already integrated with the top two or three things on the market. And as long as everybody else on the face of the earth writes a plug-in for my uh, application, boy, is the world going to be awesome. Hmm. Well, that can't be it. Because not everybody's going to write a plug-in, and when I lose my phone, it all gets lost. And even if I uh, manage to back it up, certainly when I change from iOS to Android to something else, which I do about once a year just to stay honest, I don't want to rebuild all this crap. So that can't be the answer. So super remote control, all this client-side integration, can't be it. So the next thing people say is, 
basically the same thing, but in the cloud. So let's do cloud-based orchestration. As long as we all choose Google, or we all choose Apple, or we all choose Amazon, or we all choose whatever, and we all trust it, and we trust them to have, uh, to have access to every single device, and we use their rules engine. As I'm saying, let's all trust Amazon with everything, or we all trust Apple, or we all trust Google, or we all trust anyone with everything in our life. How many people are itching when I say that? Yeah, okay. It's not because I think any of them are evil. It's just that, um, I'm, that I'm willing to admit. But, you know, it just doesn't feel like the way. It just doesn't, okay? So probably the one that's farthest away but has the most promise is a bit of peer-to-peer. -peer. So even when we're talking about very fine-grained, smaller things, and I guess I would say medium small things, to what extent can they be fairly intelligent? To what extent can they adaptively advertise their services, find each other in the mesh. So at any given time, I can go to the local router, or the local service discovery place, and say, here's all the things that in the house that have said they were here. Here's how they said they're scriptable. Here's how they say it'll work. And I think this is probably the right answer, but it's actually the very, very earliest days in the standards development out there. But I think this is really, uh, really possible. Now, the other thing you can ask yourself as you're building these different devices is not just, can I build an internet-enabled doorknob and can I fit into the Lowe's ecosystem or the Microsoft HomeKit <coughs> ecosystem, but if I really set what I know free, is there somebody else that can pay? This is always fun. Are there other economics? What else becomes enabled? So this fabulous system that I've been talking about here where I want to put together uh, the, you know, everything in my house to find smoke the right way and show me a video and blah, blah, blah. You know, maybe the local government is willing to give me a tiny tax break if this is in because I'm going to use less emergency services. Maybe the insurance company would be thrilled to give me a break to put this in because minor smoke damage and minor water damage that isn't nipped in the bud correctly is actually a huge part of their, uh, of their claim base. Maybe, um, maybe somebody else. Are there adjacencies on top of this around home health care, care for the elderly, uh, watching your pet? Who the heck knows? Does the electric company actually subsidize this in order to, to turn tune the smart meters and the electric usage correctly. What else is enabled is fascinating. Uh, a ton of different models can actually come on top of this. So now let's apply it to business for a minute. So, you know, typical manufacturing factory floor. In fact, at Plantronics, we have floors that look very much like this. We actually manufacture a lot of our own stuff. And I'm fascinated thinking about, uh, I'm fascinated thinking about making manufacturing work better. There's no question that as we put, uh, that as we bring all these things onto the network, that we can make manufacturing incredibly more precise, incredibly uh, uh, better products that just taste better for all of us. We can have less waste in the factory, safer environments, on and on and on and on and on. But the key is the factory can't be doing all this M to M integration. This has to be something somebody else is doing. If every factory is an M to M uh, uh, developer, we're screwed. Okay, factories need to make things and make things better. So the question becomes, and m is particularly difficult because today, m to m is very proprietary. You have very small networks that bring things together, but you're never gonna buy every machine in this factory from the same place or from the same company, never ever. You're not even gonna buy the control mod modules from the same factory, never ever. 
The question is, how do we standardize that, and what are those secondary and tertiary services that need to be released so we can actually go get new revenue streams, enable new businesses in very, very interesting ways? Um, frankly, I've spent a lot of my career on the B2B side before I got involved in consumer, and there's always an interesting question when you're innovating. The question is, the very best thing you can do when you're talking B2B is build a product, product, and I hate to be so cynical, but the best thing you can do is buy a product that cleanly fits into a single IT budget line item, but reduces cost. Because Frank, trust me, I'm not just being cynical if you're not from the business side. If you do that, they know how to buy it. When you bring it in, there's already a budget line item and there's already a budget and whatever's in it. If you come in and your innovation is a sustaining innovation that cleanly takes that out and reduces that budget line item, rock on. This is really good. Okay, they know how to buy it. All right? So disruptive products that come in and don't fit into any budget line item are really hard. This is really cool but I don't buy it out of this budget, and I don't buy it out of this budget, I need a new budget, all right? The very best innovations are the ones that cleanly pay for themselves out of one budget line item, but they also take money out of two or three others, okay? So when I put this in place, Mr. Uh, head of Manufacturing, CFO and CIO all working together to buy this manufacturing system, the cool thing is, you know, the controllers for the machines are going to drop in price, and it'll pay for itself based on that, and the maintenance costs are going to go down over here, and you can reduce the hours in this con uh, contract, and you're going to have happier workers, and your SAP deployment is going to get 32% more, uh, more efficient because you're going to know precisely in real time what's happening on the factory floor and your materials cost is going to come down. That's a winner. And that happens from unleashing the data in ways you can't understand. So true, 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 uh, true, true, true open standards around all this to allow things to grow on top in new and uh, unexpected ways. You know, I have to say, I ordered a new car from Germany and I saw a sliver of this. It was great. You know, it was almost the gamification of, uh, of buying a new car. Uh, it wasn't a very nice car, but nevertheless, it was a lower end BMW, but it was pretty freaking cool, okay? In that I bought the car, and they told me it was a, um, uh, almost a six month wait, four and a half month wait. And my initial thought was, I was crushed. Because car buying is an emotional purchase, at least for people that are into cars, right? So they told me this, and it's gonna be, I, I was just crushed. And they said, but, but you don't have to completely wait. You can watch. You can what? I said, well, log on to this website, and it'll show you every couple of days where it is in the manufacturing process and then where it is in the shipping process. So I watched my car go from the frame had been selected to the engines being put in to they're painting it to they're taking it out to detail. It's been loaded on the first truck and it's being taken to the port in Germany and now it's coming across and why is it setting, sitting in Long Beach for so long clearing customs? Okay, but, but there was this gamification of buying a car and it was really, really, really cool. And I was thinking about all of the other things that could, that could be built on top of that. There could be a whole economic built on top of that for uh, people that are irrationally, uh, on one hand, people that are irrationally uh, impatient and other people that like to make a little bit of money on arbitrage. So can you build something on top that's watching all of them and could actually notify me, you know, your car's still six weeks away and your vacation's coming up. Pretty easy to see all that with a mashup between Google Calendar and this. Philip's new car is due in a week. And it's only one feature different, and he's willing to swap you for a thousand bucks. Okay? 
And suddenly, you have an interesting new economy nobody would have dreamt of built on top of all this. And now, having these things into the factories, da da da, really, really important. All right, so let's go over to the people for a few minutes. A few minutes. This is what this is what really turns me on these days. I love, love, love just thinking about the city street of the future. Because once everything is on the infrastructure, once it's been wired, the free for all begins, and it is going to be so, so, so interesting. When everything's connected, everything can change. Every single group and individual process in our life fundamentally has the option of getting better. We need to be in charge. We can't be drones on the conveyor belt being led around, but we have the, we have the ability to suddenly have everything better. We have, once there are sensors on every one of those windows watching the light, watching temperature, watching the vibration from the sound of the bus coming down, on and on and on, we have the, the ability to soundscape an amazing new working environment where every single room, we're tuning the shades and the lighting just perfectly based on the sunshine outside. We're intelligently controlling the thermostat. We're ramping up and down the background sound deadening, very much the business we're in at Plantronics, all in real time based on what's going on. When every street light is, uh, is connected, we can intelligently turn them on and off to provide optimum light, no, hot, uh, no bright spots, no blind spots, no use of power that we don't need. We're able to make it safer to walk across the street. It's really, really uh, uh, fascinating. And then we put the person in the middle. Then we put the person in the middle with it, with their wearable technology. And we talk about how they interact with, with the world around them. And you know, it's interesting. At Plantronics, I talk and talk and talk to people about all the great stuff that can be done. And frankly, people say things that make me squeamish. You know, oh, well, I want the world around me to know everything that I'm feeling. And uh, I don't. No, not at all. There's actually four things that I want as my wearables interact with the world around me. The first thing I want is I want, I want things to know that they're mine. Like I said, I want identification services, the things that are in my house, they are mine, they are my wife's, uh, and they are on temporary loan to my children to be revoked at any given time based on whatever a meanness they're in. I also want to be able to lease things. So in other words, when I book a meeting in a conference room, I book the meeting, as I'm walking into the room, I want the things in the room to become mine. The thermostat becomes mine, the lights become mine, the projector becomes mine, it turns on, my slides get shared, the conference call comes on, and holy crap, people are able to actually connect to it. And at the end of the hour, I want the lease to expire, and they become yours for the next hour. So I want things to be mine. Number two, I want things to work together. We've talked about that a lot. Um, I don't want other people using my stuff unless I say it's OK, right? This is really, really intriguing. It's, um, I actually have an internet connected, uh, obviously the thermostat's in the house. I have an inter internet connected thermometer out in the backyard, uh, kind of a rain gauge and all the little we dorky weather stuff. Yeah, I'm a nerd. Uh, but actually, it's uh, wired in for intelligently watering the plants based on the heat and the cold and all this good stuff. Text me if I, uh, if I need to uh, cover the little citrus trees and all that good stuff. And it's kind of funny because my neighbor asked me, because I live in Silicon Valley and everybody's a geek, he said, you know, instead of me buying one, it's sitting right there by the, fen by the fence. Can I tap in? I said, yeah, cool. Until we thought about how to do it. Because the problem is, right now, there's no way to let him tap into that trivially without also letting him tap into the whole house and run my thermostats up and down. And, uh, and he's a good guy and all, but I don't know. He plays the piano. I don't quite trust him. And, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, th there has to be a better way. We've got to work through the taxonomy of sharing all these devices. And because of the stakes, when everything's connected, it has to be really, really, really secure. No question. So, you know, 
the path to all this, and by the way, this world's upon us. I can see it, I can feel it, I can sort of kind of make it work. There's great people working on the connectivity. But, you know, like now, it's not going to be smooth. There's going to be gaps along the way. You know, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be disconnects, just like there is at the moment. And the real key is to standardize it and then work on them. I just had to throw this in, even though it's a non sequitur, uh, for how early we are in all this and needing standardization. First question, what brand of light bulbs are in your house right now? Does anybody know? You know. Ikea. Ikea. Fantastic. Okay. And, and let me ask you a different question, <coughs> Mr. Ikea. Why did you choose Ikea light bulbs? Because it's one of the easiest places to get a standard color for us. Right. Because it was the cheapest, easiest place to get the bulb that met your criteria, right? If you, uh, uh, you know, as you say, to, in your case, to get a colored fluorescent bulb, right? Exactly. Um, and I would, uh, I would say that's true. For me right now, uh, you know, uh, I actually am a, uh, I'm a very, uh, uh, apparently a very discerning light bulb uh, shopper. Um, half of mine are from Ikea, and half of mine are from Costco, because it's from wherever is cheapest when I need a light bulb, and there they are, and I get them. And, the, and in the case of Costco, I have no flippin' idea what brand it is. It's whatever brand was there. Because, you know, light bulbs are pretty standard, but I love this. Right now, um, the day's going to come that I'm going to want my light bulbs, or at least my lights, connected to, my, uh, to, to the internet as well. I want to turn them on, I want to turn them off, I want to set uh, uh, how high and low the dim is, blah, blah, blah. I want motion detection when I go into rooms and whatnot. Today, every internet connected light bulb comes with an app. Okay, there's like five different vendors that make light bulbs that are internet connected and they got apps. And I was actually talking to one of them, a large European company that makes internet connected light bulbs, if that helps. And they said, this is awesome, we're gonna get rich. We're gonna get rich off having light bulbs connected to our own private app and if you want this to work, you're gonna pay us a bunch of money and you're gonna have our app. Trust me, I don't want five different apps for my different light bulbs. I don't even want five different apps for my different light sockets that are internet connected. We've got to put the standards in place. No apps, no debugging, it just works. You know, when my wife calls in, says she has a duplicate IP address on the chandelier, I'm going to shoot myself. Okay, <laughs> you know, this is not the future we're looking for. And uh, it's not the future we're looking for. So all this is really, really, really exciting. And, you know, we talk about how to flatten, how to globalize, how to make all these things work together. But, you know, just like there were gaps before, there's not only going to be gaps, but there's going to be wild cards. There's going to be nations, just like there are today, that either want to opt out, see North Korea, or that really, really, really want their own set of rules and controls and they want border elements to understand what's going on either with their citizens or, uh, or what's crossing the border and leaving. And we could all name, uh, name a lot of nations that want to do that. As the stakes go up, we got to think carefully about that. Stakes go up, security and hacking becomes even a bigger concern. Privacy is really, really, really complicated. When I want to opt out, or when I want to partially opt out, or if I at least want to anonymize, how do I make sure that all works? How do I make sure that all works? How do I know with confidence that I actually opted out and they didn't just quit telling me that I'm opted in? So the way these things tend to, uh, tend to unfurl is people, societies, governments, tend over time, when there are innovative changes, they tend over time to come up with rules, to come up with uh, codes of, cod uh, of conduct. And let me tell you, you know, here we go again. It's going to be really, really important to sort out the behaviors, the code of conduct, the laws, and just what's socially okay around all these things. We've already noticed changes 
in what's okay. There are things we wouldn't say to each other when I'm looking at you, at, when I'm looking you in the face and I know that you're a human being. But for some reason, we're willing to say terrible things to each other when it's, a, when it's online, okay? Um, I would never spy on you in really, really creepy ways by, por by peering over the, uh, the, your fence or in the windows of your house or into your bathroom, for God's sakes. But we need to make sure the code of conduct's in place so we're not willing to do that in this very, very connected world either. So the last fascinating piece of this, and we'll start wrapping up, is how the heck do we interface with all of these things? And this is really the part that's had me going for the last few years. And it is where wearables help. So, you know, it's bad enough to interface with our technology today, but how do we understand in the future, um, where's your focus? What's your intent? What am I looking at? What am I working on? What's my current location? How do we bring all this together and make intelligent guesses about what you're trying to do? Position the things where you want. If the stakes are low, go ahead and do it for you. If the stakes are high, just make it very easy for you to do it. This is really what turns us on at Plantronics. This is why we're involved in talking about all this. As, um, as we like to call ourselves a 53-year-old wearable startup in Santa Cruz, California, uh, because we've been making headsets there for that long, you know, we really think a lot about how do we both advertise using every sense that we can. So how do we advertise using motion because we know where your attention is with something on your body? How do we advertise with tone of voice? How do we advertise with voice commands, with touch, with sight? How do we command and bring the, uh, the ever-expanding internet and really bend it to you to have better outcomes for your whole life? Not to make you more productive, because making you more productive sounds like a treadmill, but how do we help you accomplish what you want to accomplish? How do we help you be well mentally and physically and emotionally as we do all this? So, you know, I guess the takeaway from all this for me, and maybe I am becoming an old guy as we go through this, but the takeaway is the next phase of the internet as we blow this out to hundreds of billions, maybe even a trillion connected devices that pervasively measure, monitor, and help us with every single thing in our, our, our health, our home, our entertainment, and our business life is we must, 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 must put the person at the center. It has got to be about us. It can't be about the technology, it has to be about us. There'll be more technology, but we need to make it more invisible and more helpful. Life's gonna be easier, because we're gonna eliminate barriers, eliminate friction, we're gonna automate and simplify. The whole world's gonna taste better, and I really, really, really do believe that. It'll give us time back. It'll give us the ability to focus on the things we want to focus on at, light, at work and at home, and we think that's really cool. However, the cautionary tale is, um, you know, we're responsible for what shakes out. It's up to us. So we need to build, but we need to think very, very, very carefully about the secondary and tertiary economic and social, uh, and social changes that we're bringing and um, make sure that over the next 30 or 40 years that it's going to take for this to ripple through society and us all to get comfortable with the new world that we're doing the right things. Um, that's it. <laughs>